You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 85. Welcome back, Curd Nerds, and I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Yes, it's been a while in between episodes, I know. I think I've said that about a thousand times before. But uh, yeah, it's um, it's been a interesting time since I last released a podcast. We've gone through a global pandemic. We're still going through a global pandemic as we speak. Uh, but the good news is we're on the other side and we have a vaccine. Well, most countries do anyway. So hopefully you've been vaccinated against this horrible pandemic and can focus on your cheese making. And that's why we're here, to learn about cheese making at home. So some of the things that have been going on in my world, well, uh, you probably... Well, if you... Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll probably be aware that uh, my wife Kim was very sick Uh, for a while there. She uh, got um, breast cancer and uh, she's been going through a lot of treatment to treat that and it was a... it was a worrying time for me, that's for sure, and and obviously for her. Um, But we've managed to get through that. She's gone through all the treatment. She's on the other side and... um, um, now, basically, we just have to uh, wait for the five years after treatment to make sure it hasn't uh, gone. But she's going back for regular checkups and stuff like that. I know this is not about cheese making, but I just thought I'd let people know what's going on. Anyway, uh, that was last year's news. She finished treatment um, early, no, late last year. Um, so she's all good now, which is great. But the chemo has knocked her for um, six and uh, she does get fatigued a lot and all that sort of stuff. Um, As far as cheese making goes, I'm still making cheese regularly on a weekly, yeah, just about a weekly basis, which is absolutely fantastic. I'm enjoying that and uh, producing lots and lots of videos over on YouTube. But I thought I'd give the podcast another go. I really did. Um, What I've been trying to do is remove all the barriers to um, podcast production and I put so many up in front of me that it just became overwhelming and I kind of pod faded, what's known as pod faded, uh, fading podcast there for a while. Um, But what I've done, I've moved over to a new podcast host for the audio only version and it has made it so much easier. Uh, If you're in the market yourself for podcasting, then uh, I highly recommend Buzzsprout, which is a uh, podcasting, audio podcasting host. And I found it so easy. It was so easy to migrate all the files off the other host and and to set it up to uh, to go to just about every podcast uh, directory on the planet automatically, which was fantastic. So I highly recommend Buzzsprout for your audio podcast. What else has been going on? Well, lots of stuff, but I I won't ramble on anymore because I think it is time for the news. So in the news recently, and because of the global pandemic, Um, Apparently, according to the UK Government Waste Scheme, RAP, more than a half a million tonnes of dairy products are wasted every year, with the majority thrown away in our homes. Uh, And while the pandemic has increased the food industry waste, especially milk, because it has a short shelf life, uh, it's not all bad news. Apparently, food waste has dropped a little bit since 2019. Uh, probably because we can't go to the shops very often <laughs> and uh, go and get the food. You, if you do have an excess of milk or you've got milk getting close to the use-by date, I got a question the other day from um, uh, one of my YouTube uh, viewers and they asked, what can I do with milk that's uh, very close to or just past its best before date? Now, if it is pasteurised milk, and it still smells okay, then it's probably okay to consume. 
Uh, raw milk really doesn't go past the shelf life of seven days before it starts to go off and curdle because it hasn't been pasteurised, of course. And as we know, pasteurisation is a heat treatment that kills uh, most of the lactic bacteria within the milk. Anyway, one way to save your milk is not really to freeze it because freezing kind of uh, does split the milk if it's full cream or full fat milk. Um, but you you would have to cook with it, basically. It's, it's a little bit funny to drink. However, one of the best things to make, a quick and easy cheese, is paneer. And paneer is especially easy to make because it only really needs two ingredients, and that's lemon juice, uh, and the milk itself, and sometimes I add in yogurt as well. But it's actually best to be made with full fat milk, and it does work with uh, homogenized, pasteurized, homogenized milk, but it's it is best with unhomogenized, which I know in some places it is difficult to get. But uh, pasteurized, homogenized milk makes paneer no problems at all, and you probably got that in your fridge anyway. I'll give you the recipe. It's very simple, really. So you can add paneer as an alternative to, say, halloumi or even ricotta, uh, toss it through salad, stir fry, use it as curries, uh, in curries, uh, and it does absorb all the flavours of the curries. It's really, really good. So what do you do? You get your milk. So you will need, it depends on how much paneer you want to make. So to make paneer properly, you add uh, one to two tablespoons per 500 millilitres or what's that? That's about a pint. Is it a pint? Yeah, about a pint, uh, no, pint 600 mil. So, all right, let me start again. So you take your milk and you add one to two tablespoons of lemon juice per 500 millilitres of milk. I won't convert it. Um, so what we do is we measure your milk uh, and then pour it into your saucepan and bring it to a boil. But while you're doing that, stir it regularly. Make sure it doesn't boil over. If you start to see, just see as you see it rise, then turn off the heat uh, because it will go everywhere otherwise. Uh, and then wait for a few minutes and then add one tablespoon of lemon juice and then give it a stir and see if it starts to curdle. And it should. Uh, if you need to add more lemon juice, then do so. Now leave that rest for about three minutes and then pour it through a butter muslin or clean tea towel or whatever you got inside a colander and then play, make sure you place it over a bowl to catch the whey if you want to keep the whey or just um, let that drain down the sink. Now using, a, uh, using the cloth then squeeze out any remaining whey and the milk sods are behind and what I normally do is put the cheesecloth or the tea towel and wrap it in a kind of a bag um, and press it between two boards. But what you can do, a nice easy way to do, is just cover the cheese over with the remaining cloth that's usually excess and then put a bowl or a plate on top of it in the colander uh, and put a weight on top. I know the milk bottle, it was empty, you fill that with water. So that gives you about, uh, depends on the size of the milk bottle, uh, about two kilos of weight if it's a two litre bottle. Uh, and then leave that there for about two hours and that kind of presses your paneer. So then you unwrap it and you can, at this stage, salt it. You just put salt over the top, sprinkle it to taste. Or you can just simply put it into a microwave container uh, or airtight container and put it in the fridge and it stores for up to two weeks without getting any mould on it. Uh, so nice, delightful little cheese. My son, Ben, who... Uh, not not a fan of, um, well, I'm not going to say he's not a fan of cheese. He does love all the cheeses that I make, but uh, he's not a big cheese eater. But uh, when I do make paneer, he laps it up and he really does enjoy uh, it with, uh, with salt on top. So just a little bit of salt, just a sprinkle on top of the paneer. And it's a great little snack. But uh, yeah, Kim and I use it in cooking in Indian, Indian meals. So it's very, very nice. Anyway, so that's uh, that's the news on how to prevent waste from excess milk. Uh, instead of throwing it down the drain, why not have a go at making paneer? So now's the time in the show that we normally put up uh, listener questions, and we do have quite a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven listener questions today. So uh, moving forward, as I mentioned uh, before, one of the things I'm trying to do to make the show easier to produce 
is probably not make all these fancy little single videos for everybody's question. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, because this is on both uh, an audio podcast and a video podcast, what I'm going to do, I'm going to scale down the production of the video side of things and just make sure that the audio quality is good, which I hope it is, and uh, uh, have a fairly simple video for people to watch. I know most of the time people, when they watch the video on YouTube, they just listen to it anyway. So it's just an av another avenue to uh, to do the podcast, the the, uh, uh, the the audio part of it. Anyway, on to the listener questions. Now, the first one today is from Adam. So let's have a listen to that, and I'll see if I can come up with some sort of reply. Hey, Gavin, my name's Adam. I live in Minneapolis in the U.S., and, and I really like your videos. It uh, really got me started making cheese. I made my first batch last week. I'm going to make my second batch this week. I'd really like to see a video showing what are some of the common mistakes that new cheese makers make and how to avoid them. Anyways, uh, thanks for the videos. I really like them and they've been a big help. Well, thanks, Adam. Appreciate that uh, question. So common mistakes. Uh, I think that I probably have made a video on that already. Uh, it was called uh, When Cheese Fails, and what I do is go through a lot of the mistakes that I've made and given solutions on how to recover the cheese, basically. Uh, and you'll notice that in a lot of the YouTube videos that I create, the cheese making tutorials, I always show uh, the mistakes. So I never cut the mistakes out. I never redo the cheese. The cheese just is what it is. Uh, basically, and um, there is a, a video coming up uh, in the next week, actually. It's at the Belper Knoll, Is It a Success or a Failure? Uh, and uh, any members or uh, patrons would know that uh, they've already had a good look at that because they paid for early access. Anyway, so, yeah, that, that I always film mistakes uh, when I make them because I find that people learn a lot better uh, from the mistakes um, and uh, yeah, have a better cheese making experience. Anyway, hopefully that helps. Uh, and like I said, the video is called When Cheese Fails. Just pop over to cheeseman.tv and uh, go and have a look at that. Okay, next one is from Michael. I think that's Michael or Michelle. Let's have a listen. Good day, Gavin. This is Michelle from Holland. Thanks very much for everything you've done. Uh, your videos really inspired us. We are now making our own cheese at home. I'm happy to say that I made my own cheese press together with my boy, uh, Chris. Um, so we're really happy um, you gave us a new hobby, a new interest as well. We go to the farm now every week. Uh, we have a local farm with raw milk and they have. Uh, we have another farm in a neighborhood that has sheep's milk and goat's milk. So we can make everything we want with everything we have here. Um, and we started making our own. And our first cheeses are ripening now. They've been coated with the cheese coating. Um, we made some little mistakes, of course, because we started out with Gouda, which I think is a little bit of a harder cheese to make. Um, in case you were wondering, in Holland, we say Gouda with the CH from Loch, the Scottish Loch, Gouda. Um but the, never mind how everybody pronounces it. We all just love how it tastes. And that's just, this is what really matters. So thank you very much for inspiring us. Thank you for all the good work you're doing. Um, you'll have a loyal following in us. And uh, can't wait for the next video. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good day. Um, from all the way wimps and the Kurt Nerds in Holland. Bye, Gavin. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michelle, and and your son, Chris. I'm glad that you've uh, got a new hobby now and you're enjoying your cheese. And indeed, Gouda is a, a lovely cheese. I really do enjoy making that. And, uh, yeah, it tastes fabulous. It doesn't last long in our house, that's for sure, when I do make it. But thank you for all those kind words, Michelle. I, uh, I, I really appreciate that, and I feel very humbled to uh, help out all the cheese makers throughout the world. Anyway, the next question is from Nelly, and it's about uh, Propionic Shimani, which is a culture that's used in alpine cheeses to create eyes within the cheese, the holes, holy cheese. Anyway, let's hear from Nelly. Hello, cheese nerd, curd. 
or <laughs> I'm call, I am phoning in here from Canada. Um, I'm fairly new to cheese making. I have lots of different cultures, but I do not have proponic shermani, and it's just a dash that's used in the Jarlsberg cheese. Is there anything else I can use? Please let me know. Uh, thanks for your question, Nelly. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Propionic shimani is uh, essential in making Yalsberg or Alpine cheeses like Emmentaler or even Leodama, which is a, Dan uh, no, a Dutch version of Yalsberg slash Emmentaler. I know they all taste different because they're from different areas, but the process is fairly similar for most of those things. Uh, you cannot substitute propionic shimani for any other culture, unfortunately. Um, however, because you won't get that nutty taste uh, and the and the really good eye development that uh, propionic shimani is known for. One thing you could do, I suppose, is uh, check all the cultures that you've already got and find the one that is the biggest gas producer. Now, a lot of the aromatic mesophilic cultures do produce gas and they may give you some eyes as well. So you could check that out if you wanted to not really substitute. You won't get the same flavour, uh, but uh, substitute for propionic shimani. But uh, I do highly recommend go and buy a packet. Uh, it's not that expensive and it's well worth it if you're going to try and make Yalsberg, uh, the lovely Norwegian cheese, and uh, and get the right flavour profile. Anyway, thanks for your question, Nelly. So the next question is from Paul, and uh, let's play that. Hi, Gavin. I have two questions. The first one, I've read that you can make a mother from a starter sachet, use some of that mother to make a cheese and freeze the rest for later cheeses. So you seem to be getting several starters from the price of one sachet. Is that a good procedure to adopt? And the second one, I wonder whether it's possible to age a cheese for too long, a hard cheese I'm talking about, like a cheddar. So if you age it for two years, would it deteriorate in the second year? Well, thanks for your question, Paul. Uh, so the first one about the mother culture, there actually are special packets of uh, culture that you can make a mother culture from. They're not very uh, often sold anymore because commercial operations don't really use them. They use direct fat inoculated, which is the freeze-dried powder that you just add to the milk and then it inoculates the milk with the right lactic bacteria for that style of cheese. Mother cultures were a thing in the past. They do still have some. And yeah, you can make it up. You make it up with some warm milk, uh, let that sit for about an hour, and then you simply freeze the uh, that milk that has been inoculated into ice cubes or ice cube tray. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head how many ice cubes you put in per how many litres of milk, but there are some fairly good instructions. If you grab the book by uh, by the cheese queen, Ricky Carroll, um, it's called Home Cheese Making, and I think it's up to edition four. I think it's edition four at the moment. Uh, and that's got some pretty good instructions for making a mother culture. So, yeah, go and have a look at that book if you haven't already got it. Um, you should be able to pick up a copy on Amazon. But, yeah, thanks very much, Paul. That's the first question. The second question, ageing too long. Uh, I haven't found a cheese that, uh, besides fresh ones, you can't really age them at all. But uh, when it comes down to things like cheddar or the cheddar, cheddar family of cheeses, I really don't have too many issues with making those and keeping them in the cheese fridge for a long time. They, they really do improve uh, in flavour over uh, a long maturation period. Two years for a cheddar is not unheard of. It's certainly very, very nice. Uh, and you get a nice, strong, extra, uh, extra uh, vintage uh, cheddar, that's for sure. But no, I, they don't deteriorate as far as I know. Uh, and especially from experience, those hard cheeses like I've got cheeses in my cheese fridge from about 29. So they're two, two years old. I've eaten cheeses that I've made uh, that are hard cheeses, uh, two and a half years old, a Pecorino Romano, sheep's milk Romano. 
and that was just amazing, blew my mind. And I've had a cheddar at aged about a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, and that tasted fine as well. And it was lovely, great strength, great flavour, great body, um, nice roundness of flavour. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Paul. Uh, and thanks very much for sending it in. Well, the next one is from Robert, and it's about Ryan development. Hello, Gavin. I'm a new beginner with cheese. I've just made two, a cheddar and a Leicester. And I've gone through the all the steps and I'm left leaving it to dry for a week. Now it's getting a, a crust on all around the sides. And I've been t turning it over every other day. And it's still soft and a bit wet on the top and the bottom. How long do I leave it or how can I get it to get a rind on the top and the bottom? Yeah, good question, uh, Robert. And may I just say that you sound a little bit like uh, Wallace at a Wallace and Gromit, but that's not meant as an insult. That is a compliment, mate. But uh, thank you so much. Hello, Gavin. I'm a new beginner with cheese. Jeez, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a compliment, that's for sure. Now, Ryan development. So it sounds if, if after two or three days the... Uh, bottoms are still wet, the top and bottom, and uh, not developing a, not a crust. You don't really want a crust on your cheese. Um, it's getting dry on the outside. Uh, you may not have pressed it hard enough. That sounds like a bit of a symptom to me. However, what you can do when you do flip it over, pat it dry top and bottom with a uh, with some paper towel and you'll find that it air dries now it also depends on what you're drying it on if you use a uh, bamboo or reed mats um, for the air drying part before you wax it or, or cloth band it uh, i find that that kind of wicks away the moisture a lot better than what say a plastic mat does plastic mats have their place especially when you're making bloomy rind cheeses like camembert or brie or something like that because the mold doesn't tend to stick to the plastic as well as it does with the the um, the bamboo or the the reed matting. So, yeah, if you if you've got a hard cheese or something like that, then I do recommend move over to um some sort of wood. Uh it can even be a pine board as long as it's not treated pine. Uh pine boards work well. That's what they use in cheese caves. Uh, in a lot of commercial um, productions and they don't have any problems developing a rind. So hopefully that helps. All righty, uh, the next question is from Rodrigo. So let's play that one. This is Rodrigo from Brazil again. And um, since we last spoke, I was just, just trying the press, the press cheeses. But now um, I'm starting to go into camembert and brie cheeses and i have some questions um one of them and the most important is right now for the problem i'm having which is uh in in your video the little bird video that that you make like three little camemberts the the last step is you um you wrap it with some kind of paper and i don't have access to it here in brazil and I would like to know if you have um, any substitute to that paper. Um, can you help me with that? Thank you, man. Cheers. Thank you, Rodrigo. Appreciate your question. Uh, substitute for micro perforated cheese wrap. Let me think. Uh, a good um, grease proof paper would work equally as well. Uh, waxed cheese paper does work as well. Um, however, the micro perforated cheese paper is th the best because it's got little holes in it uh, and it allows the cheese to breathe still a little bit. Uh, and it has an inner wrapper, which is kind of like um, grease proof, proof paper. And you find that the white mold doesn't tend to stick to it, which is great because when you want to unwrap it, you don't want it sticking to the paper, of course. So try that. Try, the, um, like I said, grief-proof paper. So that's like baking paper or something like that. Could you put holes? You could put tiny holes in it, but it might be a pain at the bottom to do that. But, uh, yeah, you can give that a go anyway. 
Um, thanks for your question, Rodrigo. And the last question is from Shannon. So let's listen to Shannon. Hi, Gavin. I was um, wondering about the solution that you used to clean the mold off of cheese. It said it was a salt and vinegar solution. What amounts does that equal? Thank you. Well, thanks for your question, Shannon. So, yeah, I, I think you mean a simple brine solution. So, uh, yeah, what you can do is you can get a cup of cool boiled water. So boil the water, let it cool, uh, and then add in a, a teaspoon of salt. Uh, and uh, if you are just going to do a washed, just wash the cheese to get rid of any mould in the early stages of uh, of, of a washed uh, rind cheese, then that's what you can use. You can actually add a little bit of um, Abrevia bacterial linens to it to get the red smear happening. If you are just cleaning a cheese off and it's got some mould on it and it's still quite damp and you're getting mold, blue mould and all sorts of funky colours on it, yeah, just use that um, one cup of cool boiled water, uh, one to two teaspoons of salt, just normal table salt is fine, uh, and you can add a, a teaspoon of white vinegar or, or any sort of vinegar you've got, doesn't really matter. Uh, and that wash the cheese with that, and that should help prevent uh, any moulds from growing back, at least within a week. You will have to keep doing it. However, the cheese will eventually dry out enough that the mould will be, uh, and, the, and the cheese itself will be a dry to touch. So what you then just do is use a soft cloth and just wipe the outside and the mould just comes off. It's no big deal. Uh, if your rind of the cheese is uh, is dry, then yeah, a lot of uh, cheesemakers use a soft brush, like a nail brush, and you can brush the outside of your cheese as well. Depends on how hard it is, of course. And that, my friends, is the end of the show. I enjoyed recording it. I enjoyed coming back to the podcast. It uh, it seems like such a long time ago. But anyway, as I said, I'm going to, uh, for the video version, I'm going to reduce the quality. There's a lot of work, too much work that went into it. Um, so I'm going to make that a lot simpler. You'll still hear the questions. There'll still be the news. And uh, yeah, we'll have a lot of interesting things going on. And maybe we'll even have some interviews. That would be nice, getting back and having a few interviews uh, on the podcast with other cheesemakers. Now, if you want to be interviewed, then you can pop your hand up and send me an email over on the contact page at uh, littlegreencheese.com. There is a contact page over on that uh, on that website. And uh, yeah, just say that you want to be a guest on the show. Uh, let me know why, how long you've been making cheese and all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll do an interview and that would be just as excellent. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds. You can find my cheese making video tutorials on my YouTube channel, cheeseman.tv. That's the URL to type in, cheeseman.tv. You can get your cheese making kits, supplies and equipment over at Little Green Workshops. Dot com dot au. Thanks for listening again and stay tuned for the next exciting episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, the news theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. See you later, curd nerds. See you next time. Nice sheep. If you're watching the video version, they're sheep. Ha, 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 ha.